Fire Alarm by Michael Lowey. This is chapter one, uh, which I'm going to read in several parts because it's basically the whole book is chapter one for some reason. Uh, so this is part one. A reading of Walter Benjamin's theses on the concept of history. Before moving on to a Talmudic analysis of Benjamin's text, word by word and sentence by sentence, a few short remarks are in order as an introduction to the reading of the theses. The document on the concept of history was written in the early days of 1940, shortly before its author's attempt to escape from Vichy France, where Jewish and or Marxist German refugees were handed over by the authorities to the Gestapo. As we know, that attempt failed, intercepted by Franco's police at the Spanish border, Port Bou, in September 1940, Walter Benjamin chose suicide. The first reference to the document appears in a letter from Benjamin to Adorno, written in French on February 22, 1940. This explains the aim of the text to his friend, to establish an irre irremediable break between our way of seeing and the survivals of positivism, which haunt even the historical conceptions of the left. To Benjamin, positivism appears then as the common denominator of the tendencies he will criticize, conservative historicism, social democratic evolutionism, and vulgar Marxism. We must clear that we must make clear that the document was not intended for publication. Benjamin gave it or sent it to a number of very close friends, such as Hannah Arendt and Theodore Adorno, but he stressed in a letter to Gretel Adorno that there was no question of publishing it, as that would throw wide open the doors of enthusiastic incomprehension. His prophetic fears were fully realized. Much of the literature on the theses displays incomprehension, some of it enthusiastic, some of it skeptical, skeptical but in, in any event, incapable of grasping the significance of the text. The direct spur to composing the theses was doubtless the Germano-Soviet Pact, the outbreak of the Second World War and the occupation of Europe by Nazi troops. But it was nonetheless the summation the ultimate concentrated expression of ideas that run through the whole of his work. In one of his last letters, addressed to Gretel Adorno, Benjamin writes, War and the combination of circumstances that brought it about have led me to put down on paper some thoughts about which I may say that I have kept them about myself, and even from myself, for some 20 years. He could have written 25 years since, as we have seen, the lecture on the life of students already contains some of the key ideas of his spiritual testament of 1940. We have then to situate the document in its historical context. It was, to use Victor Serge's expression, midnight in the century, and that terrible moment of contemporary history doubtless represents the immediate background to the text. However, we cannot for all that see it solely as the product of, product of a precisely of a precise conjuncture. It bears a significance that far exceeds the tragic constellation that gave birth to it. If it still speaks to us today, if it arouses so much interest, so many discussions and polemics, this is because through the prism of a determinate historic moment, it raises questions that bear on the whole of modern history and on the place of the 20th century in the social development of humanity. The history of the rescue and publication of the theses has been minutely reconstructed by the editors of the Gesemelt Schriften. It was a copy given by Benjamin to Hannah Arendt and passed on by her to Adorno that was first printed in a kind of mimographed booklet entitled Walter Benjamin Zoom Gedaktis Gedaktis in memory of Walter Benjamin, which was intended for a relatively limited audience.
A few hundred copies of this were printed in 1942 by the Frankfurt Institute of Social Research, exiled in the USA. Paradoxically, the first publication in the full sense of the term was in French, in Pierre Missac's translation, and this appeared in October 1947 in Les Temps Modernes. It provoked no reaction. The same absence of response followed the publication in German through Adorno's good offices in the journal New Rundschau in 1950. It was only after the appearance of the text in the first collection of Benjamin's writings edited by Adorno, Schriften, that the reception of the document and the first discussions really began. Finally, in 1974, the critical edition of the theses Variants and notes with a commentary, together with a French translation made by Benjamin himself, appeared in the Gesemelt Schriften, edited by R. Tiedemann and H. Schweppenhauser, with the collaboration of Adorno and Scholem. To this, we have to add the last copy, entitled Hand Exemplar which has the peculiarity of converting one of the preparatory notes into thesis, thesis 18, 18, I think 18, discovered by Giorgio Agamben and incorporated into volume seven of the Gesemelt Schriften. In the debates which from the 1950s onwards followed the publication of the theses, we may distinguish three main schools of interpretation. One, the materialist school. Walter Benjamin is a Marxist, a coherent materialist. His theological formulations have to be regarded as metaphors, as an exotic form in which materialist truths are clothed. This was the position adopted by Brecht as early as his working journal. Two, the theological school. Walter Benjamin is, first and foremost, a Jewish theologian, a messianic thinker. His Marxism is merely a terminology, and he falsely appropriates such concepts as historical materialism. This was the view of his friend Gershom Scholem. 3. The School of Contradiction Walter Benjamin tries to reconcile Marxism with Jewish theology, materialism with messianism. Now, as everyone knows, the two are incompatible. Hence the failure of his endeavor. This is the reading shared by Jürgen Habermas and Rolf Tiedemann. In my view, these three schools of thought are simultaneously right and wrong. I should like, modestly, to propose a fourth approach. Walter Benjamin is a Marxist and a theologian. It is true that these two conceptions are usually contradictory, but the author of the theses is not a usual thinker. He reinterprets these conceptions, transforms them, and situates them in a relation of reciprocal illumination that enables them to be articulated together in a coherent way. He liked to compare himself to a Janus figure, one of whose faces was turned towards Moscow and the other towards Jerusalem. But what is often forgotten is that the Roman god had two faces, but a single head. Marxism and Messianism are simply two expressions, Ostruck, one of Benjamin's favorite terms, of a single thought, an innovative, original, unclassifiable thought characterized by what he calls, in a letter to Shalom of May 1926, the sudden paradoxical change of one form of religious or political observance into the other, regardless of which direction the better to grasp the complex and subtle relationship between redemption and revolution in his philosophy of history, we should speak of an elective affinity, or in other words, of a mutual attraction and reciprocal reinforcement of the two approaches on the basis of certain structural analogies leading to a kind of alchemical fusion, like the amorous encounter between two souls in Goethe's novel, Die Wolverwandtschaften to which Benjamin had devoted one of the most important of the essays of his youth. Though Shalom's unilateral approach must necessarily be criticized, we should not underestimate the deep attraction his thinking exerted on Benjamin, 
including at the time when he was writing the theses. An as yet unpublished document that I have been able to consult in the Sholem archive at the Library of the Hebrew University shows without a shadow of a doubt that the very title of the theses was inspired by an unpublished manuscript of Sholem's, which Benjamin doubtless knew, entitled Thesen Uber den Begriff der Kurrektigkeit, Theses on the Concept of Justice, dated 1919 and 1925. Reading this text, one realizes that Benjamin was not just inspired by the title, but also by the content of the manuscript. Take, for example, the following passage, the messianic age as eternal present and the justice of the substantial existent correspond to one another. If justice were not there, the messianic kingdom not only would not be there, but would be impossible. The objective of the notes and comments that follow is not so much to judge Benjamin's theses as to attempt to understand them. This will not prevent me from paying homage to his lucidity or, where necessary, criticizing what seems questionable. The interpretation proposed does not seek to be exhaustive, even less does it claim to be the most correct, the truest, or the most scientific. At best, it attempts to bring out a certain coherence, where so many others merely see dissonance, contradiction, or ambiguity. Benjamin's concepts are not metaphysical abstractions, but relate to concrete historical experiences. I have, therefore, chosen to illustrate his remarks with examples, both from modern European and ancient Jewish history, inspired directly or indirectly by his own writings. I have also added a number of contemporary Latin American examples. Though this may initially be surprising, it seems to me that this address this addresses an important issue, pointing up both the universality and the topicality of Walter Benjamin's concept of history. I came upon the theses at the point when popular insurrectional movements were developing in Central America. The document enabled me to understand these events better, and conversely, they shed a new light on the, on the text. For the original French edition of this work, I took as my starting point Maurice de Gendelac's sober and elegant translation, published in 1971 by Edition Maurice Nadeau in the collection of Benjamin's essays entitled Poésie et Vérité, even though it is imprecise at a considerable number of points. I also often drew on the incomplete but infinitely precious translation drafted by Benjamin himself. Drafted by Benjamin himself, which differs in certain respects from the German text and hence constitutes something of a variant. <clears throat> Sorry. Lastly, following the example of Italian scholars, I've added to the known list of theses, a new one that figures as number thir or 18 in the copy discovered some years ago by Giorgio Agamben. This thesis already appeared among the preparatory notes published in the Gesimelt Schriften as number 17a. The hand exemplar found by Agamben shows that Benjamin intended to include it in the final version of the document. It is indeed an autonomous text of the greatest importance and not a variant. It figures here as thesis 17a to avoid changing the accepted numbering of the last theses. For the interpretation of the theses, I have often referred to the preparatory notes published in volume 1, 3 of the Gesemelt Schriften, some of which are available in English translation as Paralipomena 2 on the concept of history. A few personal remarks to close this introduction. I discovered the theses on the concept of history belatedly 
Paradoxically, it was thanks to the writings of Gershom Sholem, who I met in Jerusalem in 1979, that I became aware of this document, at a point when I was becoming interested in the relations between Messianism and Utopianism in Judaism. Yet the text had been available in French since 1947 and in German since 1950. I do not know whether this delay is to be attributed to ignorance, blindness, or misjudgment. In any event, there is in my intellectual itinerary a before and an after the, the discovery of the Thesen Uber den Begriff der Geschicht. Gesch my German is obviously impeccable. Since I read the text some 20 years ago, it has continued to haunt, fascinate, intrigue, and move me. I have read it, reread it, and reread it again tens of times, with the sense or the illusion at each rereading of discovering new aspects, of delving deeper into the infinite density of the text, of at last understanding what, just a short time ago, still seemed hermetic and opaque. I admit that there are still zones of shade for me in some passages, while others seem blinding in their clarity, their inner luminosity, their incontestable self-evidence. These differences show themselves in the very unequal treatment of the theses in, in, in my commentary. Above all, however, the reading of theses has shaken my certainties, upset my hypotheses, overturned some of my firmly held beliefs. In short, it has forced me to think differently on a whole string of fundamental questions. Progress, religion, history, utopianism, and politics. Nothing has emerged unscathed from this crucial encounter. Gradually, I've also come to realize the universal scope of Benjamin's propositions, their relevance in understanding. From the standpoint of the defeated, not just the history of the oppressed classes, but also that of women, half of humanity, of Jews, Gypsies, American Indians, Kurds, Blacks, sexual minorities, in a word of the pariahs, in the sense Hannah Arendt gave to this term of all ages and all continents. Over the last 15 years, I have made a great many notes for an interpretation of the theses. I have followed the courses and lectures of such eminent specialists as Stefan Moses and Irving Wolfarth. I also devoted, devoted a year's seminar at the EHESS to the theses, and later another at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. I have read a large proportion of the secondary literature, but I remain convinced not only that there is still room for other interpretations, such as the one I propose here, but that Benjamin's text belongs to that rare species of writings whose destiny it is to prompt new readings, new viewpoints, different hermeneutic approaches and original thoughts ad infinitum, or rather, as the Shema Israel, the age-old prayer of the Jews, puts it, li olam va'ed, forever. Um, thesis, thesis one. There was once, we know, an automaton constructed in such a way that it could respond to every move by a chess player with a counter move that would ensure the winning of the game. A puppet wearing Turkish attire and with a hookah in its mouth sat before a chessboard placed on a large table. A system of mirrors created the illusion that this table was transparent on all sides. Actually, a hunchbacked dwarf, a master at chess, sat inside and guided the puppet's hand hand by means of strings. One can imagine a philosophic counterpart to this apparatus. The puppet, called historical materialism, is to win all the time. It can easily be a match for anyone if it enlists the services of theology, which today, as we know, is small and ugly and has to keep out of sight. From the very outset, Thesis 1 announces one of the central themes of the text as a whole the paradoxical combination of materialism and theology. To explain this, Benjamin creates an ironic allegory. Let us attempt to decipher the meaning of the elements that make it up. First, the automaton. This is a puppet or marionette called historical materialism. The use of quotation marks and the way this is phrased suggest that this automaton 
is not true historical materialism, but something that is given that name. By whom, we ask, and the answer must be the chief spokesman of Marxism in his period, that is to say the ideologues of the second and third internationals. In Benjamin's view, historical materialism actually becomes in their hands a method that perceives history as akin to a machine leading automatically to the triumph of socialism. For this mechanical materialism, the development of the productive forces, economic progress, the laws of history lead necessarily to the last crisis of capitalism and the victory of the proletariat, communist version, or to the reforms that will gradually transform society, social democratic version. Now this automaton, this This automaton, this mannequin, this mechanical doll is not capable of winning the game. Winning the game here has a double meaning. One, correctly interpreting his history, struggling against the oppressor's view of history, defeating the historic enemy itself, the ruling classes. In 1940, this meant fascism. For Benjamin, the two meanings are closely linked in the indissoluble unity of theory and practice. Without a correct interpretation of history, it is difficult, if not impossible, to fight fascism effectively. The defeat of the Marxist labor movement in Germany, Austria, Spain, and France in the face of fascism demonstrates the incapability of this soulless puppet, this insensate automaton, to win the game. A game in which the future of humanity is at stake. To win, historical materialism needs the help of theology. This is the little dwarf hidden in the machine. The allegory is, as we know, inspired by one of Edgar Allan Poe's stories, translated into French by Baudelaire, and well known to Benjamin, namely Melzel's chess player. It concerns a chess playing automaton presented in 1769 to the Viennese court by Baron Wolfgang von Kempelen, which was to end up after its various travels in the United States, being toured around the country by a Viennese inventor cum entrepreneur, Johann Nepomuk Mel Melzel. Poe describes this automaton as a figure habited as a Turk, which holds a pipe in the left hand in which, if it were a machine, would always win games of chess. One of the explanatory hypotheses discussed by Poe is that a dwarf actuated the machine, having previously concealed himself within it. The similarity almost word for word with thesis one is clear. In our view, the relationship between Poe's text and Benjamin's thesis is not merely anecdotal. The philosophical conclusion of Melzell's chess player is as follows. It is quite certain that the operations of the automaton are regulated by mind and by nothing else. Poe's mind becomes, in Benjamin's thesis, theology, or in other words, the messianic spirit, without which historical materialism cannot win the game. <clears throat> and the revolution cannot triumph. It seems to us that Rolf Tiedermann is mistaken when in his last, otherwise very interesting book, he writes as follows. The theological dwarf is also dead, since he has become a component of a dead machine. The whole of the automaton is dead and perhaps already represents the field of death and ruin of the ninth thesis. If the whole apparatus, dwarf included, is dead and ruined, how can he win the game against the opponent? What the thesis suggests is precisely the opposite. Thanks to the vivifying action of the dwarf, the whole becomes alive and active. The little dwarf or the hunchbacked dwarf as soul, as spiritus rector of an inanimate structure is a typical theme of romantic literature. Let us recall the Quasimodo of Hugo's Notre Dame de, de Paris, Paris, Paris. Oh no, it did something weird. Okay. And the cathedral did indeed seem a docile and obedient creature beneath his hand. 
It was possessed and filled with Quasimodo, as with a familiar spirit. Egypt would have taken him for the god of this temple. The Middle Ages believed him to be its demon. He was in fact its soul. Benjamin was fascinated by this theme. In his short story, Russ Tully's Tale, he presents a dwarf carefully concealed in a, master's, a master juggler's ball and performing wonders by working the compression springs in the interior of the ball. Theology, like the dwarf in the allegory, can act today only in a concealed fashion in the interior of historical materialism. In a rationalist and unbelieving age, it is wizened and disreputable. To quote Benjamin's French translation, and has to hide itself away. Curiously, Benjamin does not seem to conform to this rule, since in his theses, theology is plainly visible. Perhaps indeed it is merely advice to the readers of the document, use theology but do not show it. Or alternatively, since the text was not intended for publication, it was not necessary to conceal the hunchbacked dwarf from the public gaze. In any event, the reasoning is analogous to that in a note to the Arcades project, which Benjamin had incorporated into the so-called paralip paralipomena to the theses. My thinking is related to theology as blotting pad is related to ink. It is saturated with it. Were one to go by the blotted, the blotter, however, nothing of what is written would remain. Once again, the image of a determining but invisible presence of theology at the heart of profane thought. The image is, moreover, somewhat curious. In fact, as those who used this now obsolete item of equipment know, traces of what was written in ink always remained on the surface of the blotter. What does theology mean for Benjamin? This will become clearer as we examine the theses but the term refers to two fundamental concepts, remembrance and messianic redemption. As we shall see, the two are essential components of the new concept of history, which the theses construct. How then are we to interpret the relationship between theology and materialism? This question is presented in an eminently paradoxical way in the allegory. First, the theological dwarf appears as the master of the automaton which he uses as an instrument. At the end, however, the dwarf is said to be in the service of the automaton. What does this reversal mean? One possible hypothesis is that Benjamin wishes to show the dialectical complementarity between the two. Theology and historical materialism are at times the master and at times the servant. They are both the master and the servant of each other. They need each other. We must take seriously the idea that theology is in the service of materialism, a formulation which reverses the traditional scholastic definition of philosophy as ancilla theologiae, servant of theology. Theology for Benjamin is not a goal in itself. Its aim is not the ineffable contemplation of eternal verities, nor even less reflection on the nature of the divine being as might be thought from its etymology. It is in the service of the struggle of the oppressed. More precisely, it must serve to reestablish the explosive messianic revolutionary force of historical materialism, reduced to a wretched automaton by its epigonies. The historical materialism to which Benjamin subscribes in the following theses is that which results from this vivification, this spiritual activ activation by theology. According to Gerard Kaiser in the Theses, Benjamin theologizes Marxism. True historical materialism is true theology. His philosophy of history is a theology of history. This type of interpretation destroys the delicate balance between the two components, reducing the one to the other. Any unilateral reductionism in either direction is incapable of accounting for the dialectic between theology and materialism and their need of each other. In the opposite direction, Krista Greffrath thinks the theology of the theses is an, is an auxiliary construction, needed to wrest the tradition of the past from the hands of those who currently manage it. This interpretation is in danger of presenting too contingent and instrumental a view of theology, 
when in reality it was an essential dimension of Benjamin's thinking from his earliest writings in 1913. Lastly, Heinz Deiter Kitsteiner believes he can see a sort of distinction of functions between the puppet and the dwarf. The historical materialist confronts the present as a Marxist, the past as a theologian of remembrance. Now this division of labor in no way corresponds to Benjamin's ideas for him. ideas. For him, Marxism is as necessary to the understanding of the past as theology is for present and future action. The idea of combining theology and Marxism is, is one of Benjamin's theses that has aroused the greatest incomprehension and perplexity. Yet a few decades later, what in 1940 was merely an intuition was to become a historical phenomenon of the greatest importance in the form of Latin American liberation theology. This corpus of writings by authors with impressive philosophical backgrounds, such as Gustavo Gutierrez, Hugo Asman, Enrique Dussel, Leonardo Boff, and many others, articulating Marxism to theology in a system systematic way, played its part in changing the history of Latin America. Millions of Christians inspired by this theology that is present among the grassroots communities and in popular pastoral letters played a key role in the Sandinista revolution of, in Nicaragua in 1979 and the upsurge of guerrilla warfare in Central America, El Salvador and Guatemala and the formation of the new Brazilian workers and peasants movement, the workers party and the landless movement and even in the birth of the indigenous people's struggle struggles in the Chiapas. In fact, most of the rebel social and political movements in Latin America in the last 30 years have been connected to some degree with liberation theology. This is admittedly different in many respects from the theology of revolution sketched out by Benjamin, who is indeed unknown to the Latin American theologians. In this case, it was theology that had become an ossified puppet and it was the introduction of, and not necessarily concealed, Marxism that re revitalized it. Furthermore, the theology in question is Christian, not Jewish. Even if the messianic, prophetic dimension is present, and the liberation theologians stress the Hebrew character of early Christianity, and the continuity between that Christianity and the spirit of the Old Testament. Lastly, the Latin American context is very different from that of interwar Europe. Nonetheless, the combination of theology and Marxism um, the Jewish intellectual dreamed of has turned out, in the light of historical experience, to be not merely possible and fruitful, but a bearer of revolutionary change. Thesis 2 It is one of the most noteworthy peculiarities of the human heart, writes Lotzi, that so much selfishness in individuals coexists with the general lack of envy which every present day feels towards its future. This observation indicates that the image of happiness we cherish is thoroughly colored by the time to which the course of our own existence has assigned us. There is happiness, such as could arouse envy in us, only in the air we have breathed, among people we could have talked to, women who could have given themselves to us. In other words, the idea of happiness is indissolubly bound up with the idea of redemption. The same applies to the idea of the past, which is the concern of history. The past carries with it a secret index by which it is referred to redemption. Doesn't a breath of the air that pervaded earlier days caress us as well? In the voices we hear, isn't there an echo of now silent ones? Don't the women we court have sisters they no longer recognize? If so, then there is a secret ag agreement between past generations and the present one. Then our coming was expected on earth. Then, like every generation that, that preceded us, we have been endowed with a weak messianic power, a power on which the past has a claim. Such a claim cannot be settled cheaply. The historical materialist is aware of this. Thesis 2 introduces one of the document's main theological concepts. Erlosung, which is correctly translated here as redemption. 
Benjamin first situates this in the sphere of the individual. His personal happiness implies the redemption of his own past, the fulfillment of what could have been, but was not. According to the variant of this thesis in the Arcade's project, this happiness implies reparation for the despair and desolation of the past. The redemption of the past is nothing other than this fulfillment and this reparation according to the image of happiness held by each individual and generation. Thesis 2 moves imperceptibly from individual redemption to collective reparation on the terrain of history. To understand its argument, we must turn to the Arcade's project, which contains various quotations from Lotzi, an author who is undoubtedly an important reference for Benjamin's thinking in the theses. The German philosopher Hermann Lotzi, uh, who lived 1817 to 1881, long forgotten today, belongs to an idealist metaphysical school close to Leibnizian monadism. His work, Microcosmos, expresses an ethical religious philosophy of history tinged with melancholy, which attracted Benjamin's attention in the late 1930s. In a letter to Horkheimer of January 24, 1939, a few months before the theses were composed, he says he has found unexpected, unexpected support in Lotzi's work for his reflections, already outlined in his article on Fuchs in 1938, on the need to set limits to the use of the concept of progress in history. According to extracts from Microcosmos, cited by Benjamin in the Arcades Project, there is no progress if the souls that have suffered are not entitled to happiness and fulfillment, completion. Lotzi rejects then the conceptions of history that are contemptuous of the demands of past ages and that regard the travails of past generations as irrevocably wasted. Progress has also to be achieved for past generations in a mysterious way. We find these ideas almost word for word in Thesis 2, which conceives redemption from the very first as historical remembrance of the victims of the past. Apart from Lotzi's book, Benjamin also very probably draws his inspiration here from some remarks made by Horkheimer in an article on Bergson published in the Zeitschrift für Social Forschung in 1934. What has happened to the human beings who have fallen no future can repair. They will never be called to be made happy for all eternity. Amid this immense indifference, human consciousness alone can become the site where the injustice suffered can be abolished, the only agency that does not give in to it. Now that faith is eternity, or now that faith in eternity is necessarily breaking down, historiography is the only court of appeal that present humanity itself transient can offer to the protests which come from the past. The idea of an offabung of past injustice through historical consciousness corresponds perfectly with Benjamin's intentions, but he gives it a theological dimension that Horkheimer no longer finds acceptable. In a letter to Benjamin of March 16, 1937, Horkheimer returns to this problematic, but he does so mainly to criticize the idealist character of a conception of history as being in a state of lack of closure. Past injustice has occurred and is completed. The slain are really slain. If one takes the lack of closure entirely seriously, one has to believe in the last judgment. Benjamin accorded great importance to this letter, which he records in the Arcade's project, but he does not share his correspondence strictly scientific materialistic stance. He assigns a redemptive theological quality to remembrance, which is capable in his view of making into something incomplete, the apparently complete suffering of the victims of the past. Okay. Whatever. This is theology, but in remembrance, we have an experience that forbids us from conceiving of history as fundamentally atheological, little as it may be granted us to, us to try to write it with immediately theological concepts. Remembrance is, then, one of the tasks of the theological dwarf hidden, hidden in materialism who must not show himself too directly. This discussion must not blind us to Benjamin's debt to Horkheimer's conceptions.
particularly those laid out in his first book, Dawn and Decline. In that work, doubtless the most revolutionary he wrote, which was published in 1934 under the pseudonym Heinrich Regis, Horkheimer wrote, When you are at the lowest ebb, exposed to an eternity of torment inflicted upon you by other human beings, you cherish as a dream of deliverance the idea that a being will come who will stand in the light and bring truth and justice for you. You do not even need this to happen in your lifetime, nor in the lifetime of those who are torturing you to death. But one day, whenever it comes, all will nonetheless be repaired. It is bitter to be misunderstood and to die in obscurity. It is to the honor of historical research that it projects light into that obscurity. The affinity with Benjamin's theses is striking. However, neither the remembrance and contemplation and consciousness of past injustices nor historical research are sufficient in Benjamin's eyes. For redemption to take place, there must be reparation, and Hebrew, tikkun, for the suffering and grief inflicted on the defeated generations and the accomplishment of the objectives they struggled for and failed to attain. As is the case throughout the theses, redemption may be understood here simultaneously in a theological and a secular sense. In the latter sense, it means, as we shall see become apparent in the following theses, the emancipation of the oppressed. The defeated of June 1848, to mention an example that is very much present in the Arcades project, but also in Marx's historical work, await from us not just the remembrance of their suffering, but reparation for past injustices and the achievement of their social utopia. A secret pact binds us to them and we cannot easily throw off the demand they make upon us if we wish to remain faithful to historical materialism. That is to say to a vision of history as a permanent struggle between the oppressed and the oppressors. Messianic revolutionary redemption is a task assigned to us by past generations. There is no Messiah sent from heaven. We are ourselves the Messiah. Each generation possesses a small portion of messianic power, which it must strive to exert. The hypothesis, heretical from the standpoint of Orthodox Judaism, of a messianic force attributed to humans is present also in other Central European Jewish thinkers, such as Martin Buber. But whereas, the Bu whereas for Buber, there is involved, what the fuck? But whereas for Buber, what is involved is an auxiliary force that enables us to cooperate with God in the work of redemption. This duality seems to be abolished in the sense of Afghahoban in Benjamin. God is absent and the messianic task falls wholly to the generations of human beings. The only possible Messiah is a collective one it is humanity itself, or more precisely, as we shall see below, oppressed humanity. It is not a question of waiting for the Messiah or calculating the day of his arrival, as among the Kabbalists or the other Jewish mystics practicing gematria, but of acting collectively. Redemption is a self-redemption, and one can find the secular equivalent of this in Marx. Men make their own history. The emancipation of the workers will be the task of the workers themselves. What distinguishes Benjamin from Marx, however, is not just the theological dimension, but also the extent of the demand coming from the past. There will be no redemption for the present generation if it makes light of this claim of the victims of history. Why is this messianic power weak? As Giorgio Agamben has suggested, we might see this as a reference to the preaching of Christ, according to St. Paul in um, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, for the Messiah, my strength is made perfect in weakness. But the expression also probably has a present political signification. The melancholy conclusion Benjamin draws from the past and present failures of the struggle for emancipation. Redemption is anything but assured. It is merely a slim possibility, which one has to know how to grasp. Like the whole of the document, thesis two is oriented towards both the past, history, remembrance, and the present, redemptive action. According to Jürgen Habermas, the rights 
the past claims over our messianic power can be respected only on condition that we constantly renew the critical effort of the gaze history directs onto a past calling for deliverance. The remark is legitimate, but too restrictive. Messianic power is not solely contemplative. The gaze history directs onto a past. It is also active. Redemption is a, vol is a revolutionary task that is performed in the present. It is more merely it is not merely a question of memory, but as Thesis 1 reminds us, of winning a game against a powerful and dangerous opponent. Our coming was expected on earth to rescue the defeated from oblivion, but also to continue and, if possible, complete their struggle of emancipation. If Jewish prophecy is both a reminder of a promise and a call for a radical transformation, in Benjamin the violence of, of the prophetic tradition and the radicalism of Marxist critique meet in the demand for a salvation that is not mere restitution of the past, but also active transformation of the present. Theodore Adorno refers to Thesis II in an article that is Benjaminian in inspiration, entitled Progress, but he interprets it strangely, curiously reversing his friend's argument. In Benjamin, progress obtains legitimation in the doctrine that the idea of the happiness of unborn generations, without which one cannot speak of progress, inalienably includes the idea of redemption. For Benjamin, it is not unborn generations that are at issue. We shall see later that he explicitly rejects the classical progressive doctrine of fighting for generations yet to come, but those of the past and the present.